member of the executive committee of AMJA, the American Muslim Jurist Association. He got his PhD in 2004 in science and technology of economics and Islam from the American Open University. Before that, uh, he received his master's in Islamic studies from Yarmouk University in Jordan and bachelor's in Islamic economics from Al-Azhar in Egypt. Uh, he's currently the assistant professor of Islamic studies in the American Open University and the Imam of Mass KT Center in Houston, Texas. His speciality is in the field of Islamic economics and finance, and he has given multiple fatawa for Amja in this regard. Dr. Khuda, uh, we welcome you to the Muslim community. I believe uh, this is the second time. Thank you. Second time, and inshallah, many more. Uh, yeah, uh, Sheikhna, we look forward to hearing from you, and uh, we are going to have a brief uh, Q&A after the talk, inshallah. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma nawar qulubana bil-ilm wa zayin akhlaqana bil-hilm. Waftah baynana wa bayna qawmina bil-haqqi wa antakhiru al-fatihin. Amsayna wa amsal mulku lillah. Walhamdulillahi la sharika lah. La ilaha illa huwa ilayhim nushur. Amsayna ala fatrat al-Islam wa kalimat al-Ikhlas. وعلى دين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى ملة أبينا إبراهيم حنيفا وما كان من المشركين اللهم نمسينا منك في نعمة وعافية وستر فأتم علينا نعمتك وعافيتك وسترك في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أمسى بنا من نعمة أو بأحد من خلقك فمنك وحدك لا شريك لك فلك الحمد ولك الشكر يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك رضينا بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا أحبتي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته طبتم وطاب ممشاكم وتبواتم من جنة منزلا بإذن الله Thank you so much for having me for the uh, second time within almost uh, one year uh, Who can remind me with the topic that we discussed in, the, in details last time What was the topic we discussed? Islamic, Islamic mortgage companies, mashallah, is terrible. So our topic actually for tonight is more general. It's not that as specific as the first time. It's uh, uh, Islamic Finance 101. Islamic Finance 101. Of course, we'll be discussing different uh, implementation in the real life. Some discussion about life insurance, some discussion about uh, student loans, investment in the stock market. Uh, retirement accounts, home mortgaging, and so on and so forth. Let me start with the, with the fact, and I'll keep it simple, that uh, Islamic finance actually is not a fair name for that, for that system that we embrace and we practice as much as we can. It's not only an Islamic one. It is a Christian one. It is a Jewish one. It is a, a divine system from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I do not think we do uh, enough justice to the system when we just uh, exclude it and call it Islamic finance as if we Muslims are just coming up with something that is brand new that did not exist in the, in the past. Of course, I mean, in this system, we do have uh, a lot of characteristics, certain guidelines and limitations. Okay. Everybody actually knows that in the Islamic finance system, you cannot, for example, get involved in a business that is haram, that is harmful to the society, that brings like a bad outcome result, that, you know, th threats the, the, the conviction and the ethics and the value of the society. Everybody actually knows that uh, in, in, in the Islamic finance system, you cannot get involved in a business where you do not know how much you will be paying, to whom you will be paying, and how much you will be getting in return what you will be getting in return. I mean, that is, that is Islamic Finance 101. Everything has to be clear. You know your position in the business. What are you expecting? What are you paying? To whom? What is the nature of the business? That is something I would say, you know, common sense. Now, the, the, the very fundamental difference, very fundamental difference between the Islamic finance or the divine finance and the man-made one, the conventional, the traditional one that, you know, people actually are embracing and practicing nowadays 
is the lack of interest or lack of riba. Of course, I mean, we'll be having discussion, what does riba mean, right? But actually any kind of finance, any kind of finance system that does involve riba or interest, that is not, a, not, a, not, not an Islamic finance to start with. Now, my point here is that we all, we all believe that riba is prohibited, okay? But we, we also believe that riba was prohibited for different people of faith before us. That is the whole point. So riba actually, which is the main characteristics, you know, or lack in riba, staying away, you know, abandoning riba, which is the main characteristic that makes Islamic finance different, is not prohibited in Islam only. It was prohibited in Christianity. It was prohibited in Judaism, believe it or not. So all different, like divine, semantic, Abrahamic religions, different divine religions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are calling actually for the same. In addition to the fact that, that all these different you know, prophets and messengers who are calling to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to prohibited matters, all the major prohibited matters in Christianity and Judaism are still prohibited matters in Islam, in which one of them is the prohibition of, of interest. In fact, the Quran itself, the Quran itself is the one who documented to us the prohibition of interest where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I recall in Surah Al-Araf, maybe, was like, you know, criticizing a certain Jewish community in the past. He said, الْرِبَى And they used to deal with interest. They used to deal with interest. الْرِبَى وَقَدْ وَقَدْ and they used to deal with interest while they were prohibited from doing so. That is, that's my point. So, Judaism actually does prohibit interest. Christ, you know, Christianity does prohibit interest. Yes, we do have a lot of you know, like, like concerns and question marks when it comes to the authenticity of the so-called Bible that people refer to as a Bible. But let's just skip this point and open the Bible and read. You will find a lot of verses and indications where Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and Hawariyin were prohibiting their communities or their followers from dealing with interest. So it's not a brand new system that we came up with. It is actually already there. It is a divine finance. It is a Christian finance. It is actually a Jewish finance system. That's number one. Number two, abandoning riba or banning riba is the main characteristic, okay, in this in this system. What is the definition of riba? What is riba that we are keep repeating ourselves? Riba haram. Riba interest. Interest is haram. What kind of riba we are referring to? Here is, here is one of the issues that, that, that we face as a Muslim community in this society here. Sometimes you try to educate yourself by just going back to those traditional, you know, fiqh books and read, you know, about the definition of riba, and you get actually confused way more than educated in this issue, okay? You read, for example, about, you know, exchanging wheat for barley, right? That is riba, exchanging wheat for wheat with different quality exchanging musharraf orange for, for you know for apple well those are actually very authentic and very real you know categories and examples of riba but the problem here is that we muslims in, in the united states in 2022 okay we do not belong or those examples right those examples do not like very very outdated okay we do not experience them in the real life we do not exchange wheat for barley or sugar for rice or shard of date fruit for date fruit with different quality, right? So those examples actually are authentic enough, do not, do not get me wrong, but this is not the riba that we are referring to. Not the riba that we are referring to. Riba that we are referring to, referring to, is a very simple concept. It is someone who is offering money to somebody else, okay? And the recipient actually of the money, recipient of the money, is the one who is taking the whole responsibility and liability from A to Z, right? Now, the, the advancer or the financier or the lender, whatever you want to call him, right? The source of, of, of money, right? Is not taking any risk whatsoever. You take that money, you go, for example, to, uh, to Wells Fargo, you apply for $100,000 business investment or uh, uh, personal, uh, what do you call it, the business loan, okay, or investment loan. Now, once your application is approved, you take the money or the money is wired to your account, you are literally by your own, right? You make a profit, 
you break even, you incur loss, you lose even the principal amount itself, the bank actually does not care about you. There is no partnership, there is no relationship between you and Wells Fargo, for example, other than the fact that the bank actually is the lender and you are the borrower, right? There is no, part, there is no business partnership, there is no partnership between you and the, and the lender. Now, this kind of riba, this kind of riba is the most severe one, is the most prohibited one, it's a prohibition actually is something that is agreed upon. If, if we do have some differences between the four different madhahib regarding riba al-fadl exchanging like wheat for wheat or barley for wheat, we do not have any disagreement that when someone advances money to somebody else and the recipient of the money is taking the whole liability, he or she is responsible to pay off the principal amount plus extra money, that, that this is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. So from now on, whenever I say interest, or I say usury, or I say riba, I mean the following, and I want you to remember this definition because I'm going to ask you, inshallah, toward the end of the presentation. It is the premium, the premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount, along with the principal amount, right? Either as a condition for the loan, or for the extension of its maturity. One more time, slow motion. It is, the, it is the premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender, along with the principal amount, either as a condition, either, either as a condition for the, for the loan, or for the extension of its maturity. So we have two different kinds of money here. We have the principal amount, and we have the premium. We have the principal amount, and we have the premium. We have two contracting parties here. We have lender and we have borrower. We do not have partners here. We have lender and we have borrower, okay? And from the definition, by default, the borrower actually is fully responsible for paying off the principal amount and the, and the interest on top of it or the premium. Well, forget about interest. Let's call it premium, okay? Let's call it surplus or premium on top of the, of the principal amount. That is the riba that we are discussing from now from now, from now on. What does it mean as a condition for the loan? Condition for the loan means that if you are not willing to commit yourself to paying that extra amount, you cannot proceed with the loan, okay? You go to Bank of America, you ask for a loan, you said, okay, it's gonna be three PR, you told them, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing Muslim, I do not deal with interest, okay, good for you, Ma'asalam, you are in the wrong place, right? You cannot take the money. You go practice your, your religion in the masjid, do not come to Bank of America again. So you have to make yourself ready that, yes, I am willing, okay, by the law of the land, by the agreement with Bank of America, that I will be paying such and such APR, right? APR stands for annual percentage rate. So this is actually condition for the loan. If you agree, here is the money. If not, then you are by your own. Or for the extension of its maturity, it might happen, it did happen actually in the past, that before the permanent prohibition of interest, okay, you read, for example, in Muqtah al-Imam Malik, كان الرجل يقرض الرجل فإذا جاء الأجل قال أمهلني وأزيدك أو فإذا جاء الأجل قال إما أن تقضي وإما أن تربي People used to lend to one another before the permanent prohibition of interest based on interest free interest free loan, believe it or not. قرض حسن No interest whatsoever. Upon the maturity of the loan, Either the lender would approach the borrower by saying, you either, you either pay me now with no consequences on the principal amount, or if you want more money, sorry, more time, that would be fine, but you have to, you have to pay me more. You have to pay me more. Or maybe sometimes the borrower would approach the lender by saying, I know that the loan is due, I do not have enough money. How about giving me more time and I will pay you more, right? So they both, or one of them, introduced interest toward the maturity of the of the loan. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَذَرُوا مَا بَقِيَ مِنَ الرِّبَى إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ فَأَنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَإِنْ تُبْتُمْ فَلَكُمْ رُؤُوسُ أَمْوَالِكُمْ لَا تَظْلِمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ So whether you go with the, uh, for the extension of its maturity or as a condition for the loan, at the end of the day you are adding premium on top of the principal of the principal amount. That is the riba that we are referring to from now on. I'm gonna repeat the definition of riba for the third and the last time. 
Okay, slow motion. This is the premium that has to be paid by the borrower. Am I going too fast? Okay, this is the premium that has to be paid by the borrower to the lender along with the principal amount, either as a condition for the loan or for the extension of its maturity. So far, so good? Okay, that's the definition of, that's the definition of, of interest. We do not disagree that riba is haram. And now we know the definition of, of riba, okay? What kind of, of challenge we Muslims in this country actually, uh, uh, what challenges are facing? It's not the prohibition of interest. It's not the definition of, of, of interest. It is actually the implementation of the interest bearing transactions. How can we navigate through the system and find out and find out where is the interest bearing transactions to be avoided and where are the interest free transactions to be conducted confidently or safely? That is the challenge. Why we are facing this challenge? Because of the difference, huge difference between what we read in the, in the classical fiqh books okay, from one side, and the actual real life that we are immersed in, okay? Every single day you come across different kinds of charges. You either charge other people, right? Or you find yourself mandated to be charged, well, mandated to charge others, or you are charged by other people, okay? You come across something called, uh, called late fees, okay? It's not introduced to you as riba, or it is late fees. Sometimes you receive interest from your saving account. How about commission? How about honorarium? Uh, uh, How about uh, uh, overtime charge? Uh, penalty? Uh, what else? Cash back, right? Fees, thank you. Fees. How about cash back, right? And so on and so forth. Overdraft charge, okay? So you come across different charges, whether you have to pay to others or you are charged by others. You come across this charge that's oh, overdraft charge, uh, late fees, right? Cash back. Is this the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited or not? We just get confused, right? And that's why actually we need to implement that definition that I repeated three times and find out. We need to unlock the secret of every single transaction to find out is this definition of riba implemented here in a very simple, very simple words. Do we can we find out, can we just, you know, can we deduct anyone in the transaction, the deal, in the enterprise, in the partnership, in the contract, whatever it is, that's advancing money to others, right? Advancing money to others. And that money is guaranteed. And the return on the money or the premium on top of the money is guaranteed as well, without taking, taking any liability, without taking any risk. If that is proven, if that is proven, then this is actually the riba or the interest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited, whether it is introduced to you as interest or introduced to you as otherwise, it doesn't make any difference. Honestly, we do not care that much about the names or, or the technical terms or the terminology that you use in the, in the contract, okay? You cannot just tweak or change or just manipulate the term, just remove the word interest and you put profit, you remove the or the loan, for example, and you put musharaka or mudaraba. Um, excuse me, I mean, people are not, are not silly. We know very well, okay, what does Islamic finance mean? So we do not care about the term that you use in the, you know, in the, in the agreement. What we care about, what we care about is the essence and the nature of the agreement. And this actually brings to our attention a very important uh, fiqh maxim or qaida fiqhiyya that has to be in your mind like 24-7. In the same way that you know by heart definition of riba, I want you please to know by heart to memorize the following qaida, fiqh maxim. Al ibratu fil uqud lil maqasidi wal maani la lil alfadi wal mabani. What matters, what really matters in transactions is the essence and the reality, not the wording or the formality. Al ibratu fil uqud lil maqasidi wal maani la lil alfadi wal mabani. What matters in transactions is the essence and reality, not the wording or the, or the formality. Again, regardless of whatever terms that you use, some, like some Islamic you know, companies, maybe mortgage, maybe investment company, they try to impress you 
by just using some fiqh terms. Oh, this is bay'ul ayn wa istithna'ul manfa'a. This is musharaka, murabaha, and just come up with different terms to impress you that, oh, wow, those people know Islamic finance. Well, with all due respect, they know nothing, right? The, the, I mean, the, the contract itself shows that this is a straightforward, straightforward interest-bearing transaction or conventional mortgage process, although it is called, it is called otherwise. Now let's take some, some, some practical examples, okay? And do some training together, some exercise together to be able to navigate, right? And to unlock the secret of the transaction and to pass a judgment, to pass a judgment on it, whether it is a haram or halal. Does it have riba or not on it? Let's see. Okay, first example, first example. You do have in your uh, checking account, in your like debit card, you have only $300 available, $300. You stopped by any point of sale, JCP, whatever, and you purchased an item for five, uh, you know, for $500. So you have only 300 and you purchased an item for how much? $500. Most probably, most probably the transaction actually goes through. It goes through. I mean, you will be able to proceed and just get the item of $500, okay? In the bank statement, bank statement, you will see $200 that have to be paid back, right? And on top of that, there is 35, just random numbers, $35 over draft charge. It's not RIBA, no, 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 it is over draft charge. Now, who can help me interpreting or unlocking the secret of what happened. This is actually, the, you know, the, the actual, the exact exercise that we have to do for every single transaction to find out whether or not, you know, whether or not it is an interest bearing one or not. Okay, let's think about it this way. If I, if I buy something for $500 and I have only 300 and it, it, it goes through or it, it, has, it has gone through, it means that I have taken $200 from somebody else, am I correct? Okay, now is this like a gift for you $200 because you're like a very valuable, you know, uh, customer with, with Chase for the last 20 years? No, it is not, right? So this is this is a loan. You have to pay the $200. You have to pay back the $200. Okay, now you borrowed from Chase $200 and you have to pay $200 plus, plus, $35 over draft charge. So we ended up having having Chase giving you $200 as a loan. And on top of that, you have to pay XYZ amount. That extra amount is the premium that you are referring to. So you are borrowing money with interest from Chase through or by overdrafting your, your, your debit card by withdrawing, you know, overdrafting or withdrawing an amount that you do not, that, that you not, that you do not own. This is actually the initial interpretation or the fiqh interpretation of, of what's happened. That you have borrowed money with interest. You can easily, by the way, argue that by saying, no, hold on. Chase actually does have an over, like uh, what they call it, uh, overhead expenses, processing fees. I mean, someone has to process the payment and go, well, this actually, co you know, uh, uh, costs money. That is very, very possible, very possible, right? But I'm here tonight actually just to establish some fundamental basic rules, right? The, the default rule is that the overdraft charge is an interest because that's an amount that you have to pay as a borrower to the lender along with the, along with the, with the, with the principal amount. That's, that's one example. Second example. Okay. I told my brother here that I'll be giving you $5,000 as a loan, as a loan. And you have from now until the end of 2023, okay? You need to pay me back $6,000, $5,000 uh, principal, $1,000 interest, okay? In December 31st, 2023, okay? And then I changed my mind. I said, you know what? I'm going to put that amount. Uh, I'm going to open a saving account with, uh, with Capital One. And I open, and I open a saving account with Capital One, $5,000. Based on the agreement with, with, with Capital One, they're going to pay me back or just release the amount as $6,000 toward the end of the, of the year. $5,000 principal, and the extra money actually is interest. 
is interest, right? So by the end of the year, by the end of the next year, 2023, uh, if we if we stay alive, I will be getting six thousand dollars from from Capital One. Now my question to you: What is the difference, technical, technical, legal, fiqh difference between me offering those five thousand dollars to my brother here to be paid back six thousand in one year, where he does guarantee the principal and the premium on top of it? versus me opening a saving account with Capital One, okay, where Capital One does guarantee the principal and the premium. Same amount, same duration, same conditions. Is there any difference between the two different scenarios? The answer actually is no, there is no difference. Technically speaking, legally speaking, right? Uh, financially speaking, just, just, just copy and paste. Okay, what does this mean? It means that that opening a saving account, opening a saving account is an interest-bearing transaction where the recipient, right, which is Capital One, our example, I said, right, uh, is guaranteeing the principal and guaranteeing the premium by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Regardless of what happened, they burn out, they make business, they lend the money. You do not care about them, right? They are by their by their own, okay. They have to guarantee you the 5,000 principal amount and $1,000 on top of it from now all the way until the end of 2023. So opening a saving account by default is not a halal option. Now do not tell me, okay, what is the alternative? Well, I have a lot of money. I can, well, that's completely different discussion, okay? I want to set off the inflation. I want to have at least 2.5% for the zakah. All these different issues are very irrelevant with all due respect to our discussion here because we are just establishing very fundamental orthodox if you wish basic rules about 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 fiqh fiqh riba so opening a saving account is not a halal option by default period okay right. a third example i do have a family plan with uh, with verizon for myself and my family members where i uh, i pay them $190 a month, okay? Toward the end of the month, because of me and my wife and kids using their service, I owe them, Verizon, $190. I owe them, okay? I did not borrow from the money, by the way. So technically speaking, this is not a, a loan, this is a debt service, thank you, okay? I do have some employees at, uh, at Guidance College the one that I'm representing tonight. So at the end of the month, I owe my employees their salary. I did not lend them money, okay? I did not borrow, I did not lend them money, but they worked actually for guidance card for one month. So I owe them their salary toward the end of the month. So this is technically speaking a debt more than to be a loan, okay? In the Islamic finance system, in most cases, most cases, debt is equivalent to a loan all the rules and the restrictions and the guidelines that we do apply to the interest-bearing loan are to be applied to the debt as well. Are to be applied to the debt as well. Now, back to Verizon. Every single month you receive a, a utility bill, right? And it does have a due date. What will happen, what will happen if you purposely, purposely waited until, until it is overdue? You have to pay something called late fees late fees so you owe verizon or i owe verizon 190 dollars and i waited like after the due date okay in which i just exposed myself you know to pay them uh, you know uh, 220 dollars one 190 you know the, the 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 like the basic amount plus what is called the late fees now if we agree that loan well debt is equivalent to a loan and i have to pay them way more than or less way more than whatever I owe them, then the extra amount, the late fees will be counted as, will be counted as, uh, as interest. Again, you can, you can argue that late fees actually is important. Uh, I mean, couldn't be avoided, especially when it comes to like uh, lease agreement or rent agreement. Um, you know, the, the, the recipient does not use the money for himself. He puts the money aside, you know, to pay it to a law firm or to a collection agency to go like after the delinquent account. I mean, that's very, very possible, very possible, right? But again, we are here tonight to discuss very fundamental and basic, basic rules about, you know, about RIBA. So by default, the late fees 
is a kind of of interest. Do not expose yourself to pay to pay late fees. Okay. Let's take the. I'm sorry. 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 Yeah. If you give me maybe a, maybe another ten or fifteen minutes to further the presentation, I'm just here to open your appetite, like for more discussion. Inshallah, I'll stay after that. So I get my dinner, I get my coffee. I'm just willing to stay until tomorrow morning if, if you are willing to. <laughs> طيب. طيب. Let's let's just uh, take like the opposite example now. Okay, and I want you to help me uh, passing a fatwa. How about the cash back? Cash back. Okay. Do not jump to a fatwa. Take just you know one one minute. Okay, use your credit card. Okay, you you borrow one hundred dollars from credit card company, and you get five dollars cash back. So the net amount that you pay is one hundred minus five. That's ninety five. Oh, that's that's less than okay. Is it is it riba or not? Just think about it. Do not answer. Think think think. What's that? طيب. And what I'm what I'm caring about what I'm caring about here tonight is the is the process itself is the thinking you know thinking process. I mean, how to determine that this cash back is riba or not? We need again like for every single transaction, just pause, okay, uh, uh, think about it, try to unlock the secret of the of the transaction, and then you can come up with a with an answer. Here is here is what's going on. When you when you when you get cash back, it means that you are using your credit card and not your debit card. Am I correct? Credit card means that that you are borrowing money, borrowing money from the credit card company. You can borrow that money by stopping by any ATM machine, just withdraw some cash. You can pay bills, you can purchase items. You have something called line of credit, right? So at the end of the day, you are borrowing money from the credit card company. So we are talking about loan agreement. Am I correct? You are you are the borrower, and the credit card company is the is the lender. Okay. Now you purchased an item for one hundred dollars. It means that you borrowed from the third party from the credit card company one hundred dollars. Now riba actually is to pay one hundred plus. Riba is to pay one hundred plus. But in the real life, with the cash back. For those one hundred dollars that you borrowed, you will be rewarded five points. Five points are translated into or converted to five dollars. So you borrow one hundred dollars and you pay back one hundred minus five equals ninety-five. So you pay less. You pay less. If you are to pay some way somehow one hundred or five, one hundred or five. That's that's riba. You borrowed one hundred and you paid. Premium on top of the principal, as we already explained several times. But in this case, actually, you borrow and you pay, and you pay less. You do not pay more. So actually, cash back, cash back is completely the opposite of riba. The opposite of of riba. So cash back actually is halal. Cash back is is halal. Now let's take another another example, another good example. Okay, you want to you want to buy. A house from your neighbor okay you want to buy a house from your neighbor non-muslim neighbor john smith john smith actually is asking for asking for one hundred thousand dollars cash for the house right and you do not want to like involve banks and you do not have one hundred thousand so i told him you know what uh, i'm interested but i do not have one can you make an installment for me he said yeah sure why not but there will be some charge, some interest. I told him, well, I do not deal with interest. He said, well, th 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 this is what I have for you. You take it or you leave it. So he put in the contract, $100,000 price, right? And added, let's say, $20,000, $20,000 interest. And he insisted actually in putting interest, okay? In order for you to have that deal, like an you know, installment sale instead of spot sale, let's say for 10 years, more or less, or whatever details. So he, he said, listen, this is $100,000 cash, okay? Or 120 for 10 years in installment. Installment means 100 principal price, 
plus twenty thousand dollars interest. Okay, deal, deal, sign. Okay, if you get involved in this deal, are you paying John Smith twenty thousand dollars interest? Do not answer. Do not answer. Just, just, just breathe. Think, think. Okay. Five. Let me. Five. Let me. Let me confuse you more. How about that? What if you decided? What if you decided to go to Bank of America and to borrow one hundred thousand dollars and to pay it cash to John Smith and to pay that one hundred, one hundred twenty within ten years to Bank of America? Okay. Will it be equivalent to having an in-house or owner finance with John Smith? It is. It is not. It is not. Now let, let me just make it clear. If you go to a third party for borrowing purposes, that's an interest-bearing loan. Clear? You borrow from Bank of America 100, you pay it back 120. Bank of America you know, did not purchase the house. There is no partnership, nothing whatsoever. Just you know, straightforward mortgage process. Right? But if you have chosen to go with John Smith himself, well, guess what? There is no loan to start with. You are not even borrowing money from John Smith. Right? He has a house. And he's asking for 100,000, very straightforward deal. But you do not have cash. Well, because of the opportunity cost, because of the time value, okay, he is asking for $120,000 price. Okay, now, is it, well, forget about John Smith, even, even if the owner is, is Muhammad Abdullah, is it okay for him to ask for two different prices for the same commodity because of the installment? duration can he ask for extra price because because the difference between the spot sale and the credit sale yes he can yes he can okay so having two different prices and i want to establish this clear having two different prices for the same commodity based on the based on the uh, uh, options like spot sale versus credit sale right is permissible is permissible and to make it even clearer if the market value of the house is only 100,000, right? Does he have the right to ask for 120 cash money? Yes, I mean, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, this is what I have. You take it or you leave it, right? If you think that I'm like inflating the price, you just go and find somewhere else. So if he does have the right, he does have the right to overprice or to inflate the price for like spot sale, why cannot he just break down those 120 into 10 years, right? This is, by the way, one of the very few cases where the Islamic finance system does appreciate what is called the uh, opportunity cost or the time value, which means in our example, if John Smith has decided to go with somebody else, okay, and sell that house for $100,000 cash, he was able to make $20,000, you know, profit by involving that money, different business within, within 10 years. So he has compromised, he has, you know, given up that opportunity to make you happy as, as his neighbor. So you need to compensate him for that. That's called taklifatul fursat al-badila or qimatul waqt. This is one of the cases where actually uh, the time value and the Islamic finance system actually is appreciated. But to answer the question, answer the question, the interest that is added or incorporated in the agreement is not the interest, the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited because you are not borrowing money to start with. So it is called interest, but in reality, actually, it is, it is, it is not, right? Right. One more example. How about that? Let's go back to the to the let's go back to the mortgage issue that we discussed uh, last time, right? What does what does mortgaging a house in the U.S. mean? It means that that you, as a customer or as a victim, actually, you get involved you get involved in three different transactions simultaneously. Okay, you sign a sale agreement with the landlord where you are interested in buying his or her house. And then you do not have half a million dollars to pay cash. So you apply for a loan or for a mortgage, right? And upon approving your application, the mortgage company would issue a check, okay? On your behalf, payable to the landlord, half a million dollars. And you have to pay it back $800,000 within 30 years, right? So this is actually the loan agreement. And the third one actually is the is the lien agreement or the mortgage agreement, where the mortgage company wants to secure its fund, make sure that 
if you just you know walk away or you pass away or you just uh, whatever happened they can just go after the property okay foreclose the property and get their get their property back because you defaulted right so you're talking about sale agreement and the loan agreement and the lien agreement okay some people actually get confused whenever they say the mortgage company's name on the deed of trust they think oh this is the owner of the, of the house no they are not the mortgage company actually is the lien holder of the of the of the property and not the owner you are the owner you are the borrower okay of the of the money you are the owner of the house and they are the lien holder they are the lien holder okay now we see Or oh, exactly. Or oh, exactly. Thank you. Very good cash. Exactly. So, so we ended up having three different, three different deals are taking place simultaneously. Do we have an issue with the sale agreement? No. Do we have an issue with the mortgage agreement? No, we do not. Okay. In the Islamic finance system, actually, the lender does have the right to ask for a secured loan. They call it the technical term. وَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ وَلَمْ تَجِدُوا كَاتِبًا فَرِهَانٌ مَقْبُوضًا الرِّهَانَ actually is the mortgage. I mean, this is the ayah in the Quran. وَإِنْ كُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ وَلَمْ تَجِدُوا كَاتِبًا فَرِهَانٌ مَقْبُوضًا If someone actually is asking me for $100 loan, and I do not know him very well, can I ask for his phone or his, you know, car or watch or whatever to keep it with me as collateral, right? Until he comes back and give me the money? Yes, I mean, I can. That's exactly what, you know, what happens with the mortgage company whenever they put a lien on the property. So we do not have an issue with the lien agreement or the mortgage agreement. We do not have an issue with the sale agreement. We do have an issue with the, with the loan agreement, right? So we ended up having two halal transactions, lien agreement or mortgage and sale agreement. And one of them actually is, is haram. If you wanna go with the, like, you know, democracy, as they say, two against when you go with the majority, then mortgage should be, should be halal. But in the Islamic finance system, actually, it goes the other way around, unfortunately, right? If, if, if one deal, one segment in the deal is proven to be prohibited, then the whole deal actually is ruined. The whole deal actually is haram. So by default, by default, mortgaging a house is not a halal option. And again, okay, you say, oh, there is a darura and haja, Shaykh Qaradawa, rahmatullah alayhi. I mean, all these different discussions are actually very irrelevant. You know, to this uh, uh, very basic, very basic presentation about the basic rules of of riba. By default, mortgaging a house does involve does involve riba. Now, can you see the you know the pattern, the exercise that we do? Every single transaction, you need to pause and try to unlock the secret of the transaction. Try to unlock the secret of the transaction. If you can deduct and find out that someone actually is giving someone is giving money to somebody else without taking any liability or any inter, uh, any risk whatsoever right and the other party is the one who is taking the whole risk that is the riba that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited something else that 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 you come across you know occasionally your non-muslim friend okay might ask you a question why why interest is prohibited when i go to bank of america and apply for a loan and they charge me 3% APR, and I go just upgrade my business and make 10, 15% profit. I pay the principal, I pay the interest, everybody is happy. Why, I mean, why river is haram? Well, that's, that's a good question. And my answer actually is that the example that he mentioned is not the only example that takes place in the real life. Sometimes you borrow from a bank and you do not make 3% or 10 or 15%, you make even way more than 100% profit. 100%, well, sometimes you make 1,000% profit, and I mean what I say, right? So if you borrow from a bank, and you pay them only 3%, and you make 1,000% profit, you keep the profit for yourself, and you give the bank just fractions of, of, of the profit, this is actually very, very unfair, unfair to the bank. Even if the bank actually is happy, there is no justice here. There is no justice here. Now, let's take the other extreme example where you borrow money. Let's say you borrowed money back in March 2020, just a few weeks before the, before the COVID-19, the pandemic, right? 
and then you know the the, the whole economy in the, in the USA got got frozen because of the pandemic, right? By the law of the land, the bank actually can go after those borrowers. Okay, maybe there are some exceptions, but this is not the default rule. Default rule is that they can go after you, asking for the principal, and asking for the premium according to uh, you know our our defi definition. Well, if you did not make any profit whatsoever, you were unable to break even. You were unable even to survive. You just ran out of business because of the pandemic. Is it fair enough for the bank to go after you and to ask you for the principal and for the interest on top of it? Well, this is absolutely, absolutely unfair, right? So our answer as practicing Muslims is that whenever, whenever riba, whenever riba implemented, okay, is implemented in any society, it brings a lot of, a lot of injustice and exploitation taking advantage of the needy individual, needy for the fund, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants justice to be, to be implemented. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he prohibits something, he prohibits it every time, everywhere, for everybody. Whether riba is 2% or 20%, doesn't make any difference. Whether riba in, in, in a zuru or a timar or in cash money or cryptocurrency, it is still actually haram. Whether, whether the economy is flourishing or just, you know, uh, there is a recession, it doesn't make any difference. Riba actually is haram every time, every, everywhere. Now, this model, okay, which is, which is like giving money to others without taking responsibility is called the risk shifting model. Risk shifting model, where Bank of America is just putting the liability and the money in you, you are by your own. You just do whatever you want. I don't care about you. You come back after one or two years, you pay me the principal and the, and the premium, right? Now, the Islamic finance system goes with the risk sharing model. That's completely different. Every single mode of finance, every single mode of finance in the Islamic finance system does have to show a certain percentage of risk or liability taken by the financier himself in order for him to justify the profit that he is asking for. And that's the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet Al-Kharaju bil-Daman. Subhanallah. In two, in two words, actually, he just summarized the whole issue. He said, Al Kharaju Biddaman. Profit follows liability. You want to make a profit, Ahlan we would love to see you flourishing in your business, but you need actually to take a certain amount of risk. Okay. Uh, we talked about Islamic Islamic mortgage companies last time. If you want to go with the ideal, ideal one, if you still remember, it was the Musharaka one. Is that correct? You remember it? The diminishing partnership or the declining partnership where you purchase the house jointly with the Islamic mortgage company and they have to pay, they have to pay the maintenance and the tax and the insurance proportionally based on their percentage of ownership. Okay. Even if you change your mind after 10, 15 years, you want to put the house in the market, you know, for sale. If there is any appreciation, they are entitled for their share. If there is a depreciation, they are entitled for their share in the you know, in the in the loss, it's a genuine, sound, long-term partnership between you and the mortgage company, right? Everybody actually will be treated the the same. So, in in, in, in very few words, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants to establish justice on earth, right? In fact, the main reason, according to the Quran itself, the main reason behind sending prophets and messengers to humanity to guide them to the right path, right, is to establish justice. Uh, justice in which like like well most important thing actually of the justice is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone but listen to this ayah we have sent uh, our our prophets and messengers with the with the clear with the clear evidences and we sent with them scriptures and the scale okay as if someone is asking Allah Azza wa why you did all that ya Allah why you sent all those prophets and messengers what was the answer? قال ليقوم الناس بالقسط لقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينة وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط. So actually people will be judged and treated based on justice. And when you implement, when you just permit or allow riba, you are implementing the injustice. You are ruining the justice that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala want to be to be established. And that's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prohibited you know prohibited interest. 
in the Islamic finance system, loan is not a mode of finance. Loan is not a mode of finance. If you go to the Islamic Bank of America and apply for a loan, you ask for cash money as a loan, they will say, well, you are in the wrong place. I mean, we do not, we do not give you money, right? If you, if you want to finance your business, let's sit down and talk business. What kind of business you have? Why you want the money, right? You want to establish a new business, right? Upon approving your application, you can get some money based on Mudaraba, where, where, where the money is provided by the bank, and you are the manager or the operator, right? You just start working your business, establish car dealership, whatever business you want. If there is a profit, the bank is entitled for their percentage of profit. If there is no profit, you pay them back the principal. Worst case scenario, you did not make any profit. You were unable even to break even. Believe it or not, they cannot even go after you asking for their money because you are partners, because you are you are partners, right? So loan actually is not, is not a mode of finance whatsoever in the Islamic finance system. You need to go with any of those different Islamic modes of finance. Could be mudaraba, it could be musharaka, it could be murabaha. It depends on the nature, nature of the business itself and the reason behind why you want to, why you want to, you know, have that that money. You want to construct something from scratch. There's something called istisna, the manufacturing, manufacturing sale. You bring someone to do the construction from A to Z, right? He or she has to find out how much he has to pay out of pocket, and then he can mark it up from the beginning. Okay, this building actually will cost you. Uh, will cost me $1 million. I'm willing to make it happen from A to Z. I'm going to sell it back to you for $1.2 million within the next 10 years. Throughout the process of, of constructing the building, he is fully responsible for everything. If something happens, actually, he is liable for it. Now, once once the key actually is given to you and the house or the, you know, the, the building, okay, the property became yours, then you are by your own. You pay them back $1.2. But the they took actually a huge amount of liability and risk by constructing and building that, that building. Murabaha, for example, an existing house that you want to buy. The bank would buy it, close on it, become the legal owner of, of the house, and then next day in the morning, they can just sell it back to you with a higher price. They are not lending you money. They are selling you property with a higher price. They just buy it spot sale, as they say, and sell it back to you credit sale because you do not have cash. So they make money. They make money. But in a halal way. Example actually go on and on and on. So again, this is like a very brief introduction to the to the topic Islamic finance uh, 101. I know that we, we, like we have a lot of things to discuss. Maybe uh, what, what else we did not like touch on briefly. Uh, yeah, retirement accounts, uh, life insurance. Uh, 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 what was that? Crypto, yeah, cryptocurrency. Okay, let us just take maybe just a few minutes to break, okay? And we'll we'll, we'll open inshallah the floor for questions and answers, inshallah. Just just one or two minutes. طيب يا اخوة if you if you remember last time, I, I just introduced to you a uh, guidance uh, college. Let me just remind you again with this uh, very promising project where, alhamdulillah, we are progressing and doing like very good with the, with the accreditation. We are not accredited yet. Guidance College, for those who did not attend last time, is an Islamic university. We have been operating for the last 10 years. Now, alhamdulillah, we are operating like purely, uh, purely online. We used to have like in-person classes before the pandemic. Now, you know, the whole world actually is, is running online. So we have three different programs. We have bachelor's degree in Islamic studies for the like new Muslim generation, for the new reverse to Islam. 
we have masters in Islamic education, another masters in Islamic uh, Islamic economics and finance, right? Uh, what I presented actually is just uh, I would say like a free sample or appetizer of what we offer in the in the Islamic uh, in the masters in Islamic economics and finance. Alhamdulillah, we are doing well with the with the with the construction. We've not started the you know the actual construction, but Alhamdulillah, we are almost getting the permit from the county to uh, start the construction. Our master plan, if you go to our website, guidancecollege.org, you will see like a, a like a full fledged masjid. And the second floor of the masjid, second floor, will be the, the, the main office of Guidance College. We do have a plan actually to bring back at least a few Ustanian students to have in-person class, like in class, uh, classes, inshallah. Uh, there will be a full-time Islamic school, K-12 Islamic school, healthcare clinic, uh, 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 youth center as well, like multi-purpose hall. And we do have a plan to have a kind of investment or like a side business to you know to support the operation and to cover the expenses of uh, of the college. Uh, having said that, actually we we try our best to fulfill the you know the the mission of disseminating authentic and relevant Islamic knowledge in the USA and to make sure that we are producing more uh, brothers and sisters who are like very versed in Islamic knowledge. And willing to take the responsibility, inshallah, for generations to to come, inshallah. Uh, Guidance College is a 501c non-for-profit uh, organization. Guidance College is an eligible zakah uh, recipient uh, under the category of al-fuqara and al-masakin. You can sponsor students of, of of knowledge who are unable to pay for the tuition fees. Alhamdulillah, we have like a good number of uh, new reverse to Islam who found out that Guidance College is the right. You know, place for them to pursue degrees. That's something actually makes us, you know, so so proud of what we are doing. Alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, Gender-wise, we have almost 60% females versus 40% males, which is something good. Alhamdulillah, we are able to reach out to the underserved segment of the community. We have a lot of sisters, you know, uh, joining and enjoying actually uh, studying at uh, at Guidance College. As I said, like a good number of them are revered to Islam. We do offer our own in-house financial aid and scholarship. And Alhamdulillah, we did not in the past, we do not in the present, and inshallah, we will not in the future, like turn down the application of any student because he or she, you know, cannot afford paying the tuition fees. We do have uh, in-house uh, financial aid and, and, and scholarship. Uh, please keep us in your, in your dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue blessing us with, with his help, with his mercy, with his support. To continue fulfilling that that mission, uh, this is number one. Number two, I would I would love actually to see as many brothers and sisters as possible from this community joining Guidance College. We are not here just for community education and, and, no, and, and just lectures, no, and webinars and seminars. We would love to see degree students go go to guidancecollege.org, find out which program actually uh, fits the best for your need. If you can be a degree student, that will be ideal. If not, maybe you can be just a non-degree student. Non-degree, you just pick and choose certain classes. You want to educate yourself in the Muslim family law, marriage and divorce, for example, or the Islamic inheritance law, or the Muslim family law, or maybe Islamic finance or whatever. Exactly. I got it. Even even if you are interested. <laughs> even if you are not interested to be an undegree, you just want to be a listener or, or an audit, for example. You want to take classes without doing the weekly assignment and the midterm and the final exam, that, that would be an option uh, as well. Uh, as I said, I mean, Guidance College is an eligible zakat recipient, and alhamdulillah, we're talking about like uh, at least $30 million like worth of investment you know, to build that, that, that project in West Katy. If you go to guidancecollege.org, you will see something called the Huda Islamic Center. Click on it, and you will read like more, more details about it. So uh, I would just open the floor within just two or three minutes 
to find out maybe we can inshallah sponsor a student tonight to sponsor a student for the four years four years for bachelor's in islamic studies that is ten thousand dollars maybe you decide to put your donation or your sadaqah your zakah in the construction if you decide to do so make sure whenever you go to the website click on the huda islamic center huda islamic center takes you to a different bank account and you make your donation that money will go to the construction if you click on support that money will go to the financial aid and and scholarship so sponsoring one student one student from a to z for bachelor's degree in islamic studies that is ten thousand dollars legacy that you want to leave behind sadaqatun uh, jari according to the hadith of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam idha mata ibn adam an qata amaluhu illa min thalath when the son of Adam dies, all of all of his good deeds will be terminated, except from three. And the first one is Sadaqatun, Sadaqatun Jariya. He didn't say Sadaqa, SubhanAllah. He, he means what he says. Sadaqa means one-time payment, one-time reward. Sadaqatun Jariya means one-time payment, everlasting reward. You do a very smart investment with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala by putting your putting your uh, money in building a masjid, putting your money in uh, or you invest your money and producing maybe like a knowledgeable scholar, a brother or a sister who will be equipped with enough knowledge, going to different, you know, Islamic schools and weekend school and Quran classes and, and, and synagogues and, and churches and masajid and doing da'wah and being involved in the community. As long as he or she is delivering that da'wah and fulfilling the job, as long, inshallah, that you will be getting your, uh, uh, your reward, inshallah. So having said that, within just a few minutes, do you think that we can have maybe a few brothers who are willing to sponsor maybe just one student, one student for two years, like $5,000, maybe two donors, 5000 each, that will take care of the first student. Anyone, inshallah, who is willing to make it happen has a plan to prepay Zakat al-Mal with $5,000. Anyone, inshallah, who is willing to make it happen. Anyone thinks that this is a, like a good project, a promising project that deserves your financial support, anyone who is willing, inshallah, to make it happen from your sadaqah, from your donation, from your zakat al-mal, on behalf of yourself, on behalf of someone who passed away. Do you think that that sponsoring a student for one year, which is 2,500, is maybe maybe doable? Anyone who is willing, inshallah, to make it make it happen, 2,500 dollars, okay, sponsoring one student for one year, okay. You, you can break it down maybe to $50 a month or 100 whatever is convenient for you. Anyone from the brother's, brother's side, from the sister's side, anyone, inshallah, who's willing to make it happen? Sponsoring one student for one year, undergrad student for 2500 Is that doable? Can we, inshallah, make it happen? Can you squeeze your budget? Do you think that going down maybe to uh, 1000 is more, more affordable? 1000 <laughs> Just a standard donation, $1,000. Can someone help me with that? With the pledge forms, please. So let me just go briefly with 1,000. I wish, inshallah, I hope that we can have maybe 10 brothers and sisters who are willing to sponsor one student for tonight. Who will be the first one with only $1,000 sadaqa, donation, zakah? You want the money to go to the masjid? You want the money to go? By the way, if you decide to uh, like fill out the pledge form, okay, uh, just check the endowment. Endowment means construction. Okay? Sponsorship means sponsorship, uh, sponsorship means financial aid and, uh, uh, and scholarships. Anyone, inshallah, with 1000 who is willing to make it happen, can you squeeze your budget a little bit? Can you prepay your zakah from now? Can someone reach out to the sisters and give them uh, give them uh, pledge forms? Any commitment, inshallah, for 1,000? Anyone who is willing? You want to give it a try? Squeeze your budget? Prepay your zakah? Maybe you pay on behalf of somebody else? Maybe you commit on behalf of somebody else? Anyone? Uh, sister's side, any support, any donation, $1,000. Maybe we can sponsor just one student for tonight. But do you think maybe 500 is, is easier, more doable? Can we see a few hands with 500? $500 to sponsor a student 
or if you want the money to go to the construction, that is your money, your call. صدقة جارية علم ينتفع به ولد صالح يدعو له and going charity beneficial knowledge this is exactly what we do to produce inshallah like more indigenous more uh, organic uh, people of knowledge from within the community brothers and sisters who are willing inshallah to speak the language and to speak the mind of the community any support any pledge any donor any zakat payer any Kareem, brother or sister, 1,500, any commitment? Maybe, maybe the least you can do is to make sure that you take the pledge form. You might like change your mind later on, or at least maybe you can pass it on to somebody else. Okay, let's, let's take those, those projects, inshallah, more, more seriously because you're talking about Islamic education in the USA. You're talking about the future of Islam because if we stay as is without establishing those institutes, having them fully registered and accredited and the current scholars that we are having are passing away one after another, we might reach to a point where you know, the whole community does not have enough people of knowledge. And the Prophet والسلام, in the hadith said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَقْبُضُ الْعِلْمَ انْتِزَاعًا يَنْتَزِعُهُ مِنَ النَّاسِ وَلَكِنْ يَقْبُضُ الْعِلْمَ بِقَبْضُ الْعُلَمَاءِ right? Allah does not take away the, the Islamic knowledge by snatching it from people while, while he does so by taking the soul of the of the of the of the scholars حتى اذا لم يبقي عالما until he leaves no people of knowledge اتخذ الناس رؤوسا جهالا people will be taking ignorant individuals assigning them as scholars فسئلوا فافتوا بغير علم right they will be asked and they will be answering without having knowledge فضلوا واضلوا they will go astray and they will take their community astray so we do not want to reach to that point where the whole community does not have enough you know, trained, uh, versed, you know, well-established uh, scholars, brothers and sisters who are willing, inshallah, to take their responsibility. Please support Guidance College as much as you can, the construction, the financial aid, the scholarship, whatever you feel more comfortable with. The floor actually is yours for question and answer. I will start here. Would you please, like, if you want to make it live, please use the microphone so everybody would hear the, would hear the, the, the conversation. Salam. Just turn it off. Okay. Just turn it off. Just Right. Mm. Mm. Well, I, yeah, when it comes, when it comes to the most recent fatawa issued by Egyptian scholars, we need to be like up to the up to the challenge when it comes to the political system, right? That's something that actually has to be taken into consideration. If we are referring to Al-Azhar itself, well, Al-Azhar itself actually is the one issued a very famous photo back in 1965, that Fawaid that, al-Bunuk that, here River Muharram, right? Fawaid al-Bunuk. The, the, the interest or the fawad that you generate from opening investment or saving accounts is the exact, is the absolute river. Now, because of the political challenges and, and the situation there, those fatawa, unfortunately, have been politicized, right? Uh, without pinpointing or, or like, you know, accusing anyone. But if you want to go with the original, with the original authentic fatawa of Al-Azhar, go back to 1965 and read what Al-Azhar Okay, before the you know politicization, if you wish, of Al Azhar, they were like you know clear that any kind of fawad that you receive from your saving account is the riba that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prohibited. So the the previous fatawa are the authentic ones, and the current ones actually unfortunately uh, are not.
طيب let me just make it clear يعني يعني one more time the, the official fatwa by مجمع البحوث العلمية والإفتاء في الأزهر in 1965 was a very like free unpoliticized one and actually people were unanimously at that time on agreement in agreement that that any kind of kawaid any kind of money that you generate from the saving account or the investment account that you open in a traditional bank is the riba that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited now for me for me I would I would go with the previous fatawa the current fatawa having the you know the challenges and and and, and the politicization of the uh, you know of the issue and the change actually that, that, that you know uh, is taking place in al-azhar having like some of those like big names campaigning with the with the with the regime in egypt actually makes me very uncomfortable going with the current uh, uh, fatawa if you trust them the most you think that they are independent they are like authentic they are righteous people they speak their mind they are not under pressure you want to follow them i mean uh, it's, it's absolutely up to you, but I would I would rather go with the old fatawa of Al Azhar, not the not the current ones. I know, I know, I know. طيب, let's tell the. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم. أولا نطرح السؤال ديالي. السؤال ديالي بغيت تشرح لينا شويه على الحرام لذاته والحرام لغيره والاسقاطات ديالها في المعاملات الاسلاميه الحاليه. So the brother actually is asking about about the differentiation between whatever is prohibited prohibited for itself versus whatever is prohibited for other causes, right? Like this is a, a, a very well known classification when it comes to haram in Islam. There is something called haram لذاته and haram لغيره. Let's take actually the same subject, which is which is riba. If you are getting involved in a transaction where you know avoiding riba is not an option, or riba is unavoidable, riba is unavoidable, right? Okay. Whether you pay it to others or you receive it from others, doesn't make any difference. That's something called haram لذاتي because actually you are you are embracing the haram, you are implementing the haram. For example, you apply for investment loan, a business loan from Bank of America, as I said in the beginning. If you are not willing to commit yourself to pay the interest, you are by your own. So riba in this scenario is unavoidable. Unavoidable. Versus holding credit card. Holding credit card. When you hold a credit card, you cannot proceed with the application without without agreeing to pay interest in certain cases. Only and only if you use your your your, your credit card or, you know for cash withdrawal. Only if you uh, if you do not pay your monthly statement or current statement in full before the due date, right? Okay. What if I refrain from using my credit card for cash withdrawal? What if I'm committing myself to pay? the outstanding balance every single month in full before the due date. Will I be mandated to pay interest? No. Is riba, uh, riba avoidable in this case? The answer is yes, right? So holding credit card, holding credit card is haram لغيره تحريم وسائل. Is prohibited for other causes. And based, based on this classification, if there is a public and general need, right? then going with al-haram and ghayri would be fine. For us Muslims living here in this society, right, uh, holding credit card actually is a kind of public need. Am I correct? Okay. Sometimes you cannot pay cash, you cannot pay, can't use your debit card, you cannot use your uh, personal check or even cashier check. It has to be, it has to be credit card. Okay. In order for you to build or to establish your own credit history, you have to have a credit card. You have to keep borrowing money and paying on time. So there is a public and general need. Now your need, Akhil Karim, might be different from mine. Might different be from you know his or her, right? But at the end of the day, we Muslims in this society actually is in need is in need for using credit card, and the haram is avoidable. So holding credit card, holding credit card is haramun li ghayrihi tahrima wasal. 
prohibited for other causes, thus could be permitted as needed. While al-haram li-lidatihi, going and borrowing money with interest, cannot be permitted unless unless there is a necessity. Is that clear? Right. Any any question from the sister side? Yeah, I have. A... Yeah, how the answer? Now, I I have a few questions from the sister side. Right. Oh, uh, from the sister side. From... Yeah. Can one take interest from savings account and donate it? Sorry. Is opening a saving account prohibited for itself or for other causes? For itself. Well, based on that, you cannot even open a saving account. Unless, yeah, even, even if you have like a pure intention of disposing that money, not, not, not donating or not donating or disposing the haram money, this actually is not a, an enough justification for you to open a saving account because that's something haram on lidati. الحرام لذاته لا تبيعه إلا إلا الضرورة. Right? So do not open a saving account. Period. There are like very few exceptions. Very few exceptions. One of them, for example, is that if you have any business, uh, anything to do with the with the stock market, you cannot proceed with, with with settling payments, receiving and paying without having what's called a money market account. Money market account actually is a kind of checking account slash saving account, saving account at the same time. It is an interest bearing saving account, right? But you cannot, you cannot do business in the stock market without having money market account. So oh, go ahead and open it, okay? And use it for settlement purposes only. If that account generated any interest, dollar or $1,000, you have to dispose that, that money. Uh, two similar questions. Um... Is it allowed to participate in employer matched 403b plan if you don't have control of the investment options? And the other question is, are federal retirement hold, plans... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. When it comes to retirement accounts in general, the standard that we have here is that do your best, do your best, okay, do your due diligence to make sure that your investment in the stock market is as halal as possible, as halal as possible. If you do not have that 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 leverage or that authority to custom design and to put together your own portfolio, just find out you know how much haram involved in it, how much haram involved in it. How can you determine that? Maybe you can run your you can run your 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 portfolio by any of those socially responsible uh, mutual fund companies, especially if they are like Muslim owned ones. Okay. Maybe you can run it by Zeki Financial, Z-A-K-I Financial. They do it as a, as a service, as a paid service. Send them a copy of your portfolio and they can go through it and just send you a report. Go to zekifinancial.com okay, and, and ask for the service, find out. Let's say, for example, that you, that you found out that the best you can do is to keep your uh, retirement account, 403B or 401K or pension plan or whatever, 80% uh, halal, right? pure halal stocks uh, uh, versus 20% haram. Well, keep it as is. Do not compromise or give up your retirement account. Okay, Dispose 20% of the profit of your account. Okay, Not the value of your account, no. Only the profit of your account, 20%, which is supposedly coming from the haram. And pay the account on the rest, and that will be it. That's that's question uh, one or two. Bilal, for me. Next one. Uh, you have pinpointed the problem, but what is the solution? How can we negotiate a loan for a business with the Bank of America, for example? There are not too many Islamic banks to choose from, and we are left with options like BOA. Well, you do not you do not have to negotiate a deal with Bank of America. If you, if you are strong enough and determined enough, you need to ignore Bank of America and you establish your own finance system in the USA. You do not have to penetrate the system and come up with uh, halfway solutions and semi halal. No, none of the above. Just ignore them and establish your own private capital market, okay, from, from within the Muslim community. Try to keep the, 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 you know, the Muslim dollars within, right? You want to mortgage for your house, go ahead as a community, as a strong community here in Boston, go ahead and establish your own Islamic mortgage company. 
copy and paste, you know, the model of Amin housing in uh, in California, or uh, what's called, I think, Aya or Inaya or whatever, a new company that operates completely off the secondary market, right? Sometimes, unfortunately and unwillingly, please excuse me, we just enslave ourselves to the system. We do not have to, okay? Get rid of the system, establish your own company uh, away from the system, establish like a pure halal mode of finance and, 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 and just serve the community at large. Go to aminhousing.com and read more about, you know, about this, uh, about this, this uh, model. It's, it's almost, almost 100% Sharia compliant. It's a local Islamic mortgage company. You can do the same for commercial purposes. Okay, what stops us here as the Muslim community from establishing our own like capital market, bringing bringing resources together, put them together under under LLC, okay, and start funding like Muslim-owned businesses, you know, for commercial purposes, for residential, for industrial. We can do a lot in the same way that we do have a lot of restrictions and limitations. We do have opportunities. But unfortunately, we are not standing for our values. And that's why we are just, you know, going, you know, right and left trying to, you know, find the halfway, okay, or like like a semi halal or halal enough solutions and just manipulating the system and coming up with, with, with different, you know, nonsense with, with all due respect solutions. This is the wrong way. Be strong, establish yourself by yourself. Last question from the women's side. Is core life insurance sponsored by employer allowed in Islam? In my personal opinion, actually, insurance as a system, as a system, is a halal by default. I do not believe that insurance is uh, is haram to start with. Any kind of insurance, whether it is a mutual based or a stock based or a government based, at the end of the day, is a bilateral agreement. Bilateral agreement in a sense that it is a two sided commitment. Okay. Now, for the Social Security Administration, for example, or Medicare or Medicaid, if you are not paying on a monthly basis, right? You will not be eligible to receive any compensation or benefit from the social security. Is that correct? If you do not have an account for whatever reason it might be with the social security, unless Allah, you passed away, they will not sympathize with your wife and kids and just you know, start paying them for nothing, right? You have to make sure that you do have an account with the social security. So no one actually is giving you a sadaqah with all due respect or donation. There is no cooperation or, or, or sadaqah or, or benevolence, none of the above. It's a legally binding agreement, okay? You commit to paying a premium to the Social Security or to the Medicare or to the Medicaid or to the life insurance or to the commercial insurance or business or home insurance in order for you to be eligible to receive, okay, an insurance benefit. And if you believe that, that there is difference between the, you know, Social Security from one side and life insurance, uh, uh, with all due respect, uh, I think you are wrong. I wholeheartedly believe that 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 insurance as a system, as a contract, is the same. All different kinds of insurance are bilateral agreements. Okay, you you either prohibit everything, everything, life insurance, commercial, business, uh, 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 liability, full coverage, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, or otherwise you just you know uh, permit everything. But to pick and choose and to say okay, any kind of any kind of government-based insurance is halal because it is based on you know cooperation, while life insurance is haram because it is a commercial one. Uh, this claim actually or this differentiation has no base from you know from a fiqh perspective, to my knowledge. Allah. I might be wrong. This is not the mainstream fatwa, as you all know, but this is actually what I you know personally believe that insurance actually is, is halal. And I highly encourage those who do not have their own life insurance policy, go ahead and and, and have your own life insurance policy because the because the like the Medicare or Medicare and Social Security and and your your retirement account won't be enough for your kids to you know to survive and to have like financial stability. Allah forbids in case if you're in case if you're dead. Now, if you want to be in the safe side, by the way, if you want to be in the safe side by just going with the mainstream fatwa, different fiqh councils. Okay who believe that any kind of government-based insurance, any kind of mutual-based insurance, right, is halal, well, go ahead and find a life insurance policy, okay, uh, offered by a mutual-based uh, a mutual -based, uh, uh, insurance company, okay? Double-check with Liberty Mutual, with the, like any other 
mutual based you know insurance company if they do have life insurance go ahead and just you know purchase your own uh, policy you can catch two birds in one stone you have your own life insurance okay and meanwhile you are not deviating yourself from the mainstream mainstream but personally i do not see this differentiation anymore i do have my personal my my own life insurance policy and i purchased that policy from a stock base not from a mutual base because i do not see any difference between the three different different options Allah. i might be wrong maybe allah alam but this is actually to the best of my knowledge i was with the mainstream opinion maybe uh, until 2015 or 16 and then i completely changed my mind i'm now standing clearly that insurance actually is permissible insurance is a kind of necessity especially for muslims living here in this society do not wait la samahallah allah forbids for something bad to happen to you and then you see your wife and your kids la samahallah may allah protect them all standing by the door of the masjid and asking for sadaq and donation you don't want to put your wife and kids in that uh, in that situation no tadala yes go ahead assalamu alaikum sir is go it on. me or someone else okay. thank you so much for uh, this beautiful <laughs> lecture uh my question is i have two questions actually but i'm gonna just merge them into one um it's about uh the cashback on your credit card so i my concern is that money that you get is from riba and you know that credit card companies they make money 100 percent from riba right so they charge like businesses four percent three point five percent and then they give you a portion of that money to you to to customers to encourage them to use credit cards um uh, my second question is the same but now for... okay, let's, let's let's go like one question as a sure time. now are we are we responsible for the permissibility or the source of income or funding of the other party whenever we deal with others the answer actually is no i'm responsible for the soundness and the permissibility of the deal itself now where did the other party get his money from that is actually his business and his liability unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not my liability evidence for that is that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to deal with the with the jewish community in al-madina trading with them and it is well known at that time and until today until the day of judgment that jewish actually are the founders and the manufacturers of riba is that correct okay prophet sallallahu alaihi did not refrain from proceeding with any transaction before asking the jewish guy where did you get your money from is it haram or halal is it riba or you know or not this is actually to make it clear that my responsibility as a muslim is to focus on the deal that i am having with the other party now is that money you know came from a haram way that's actually his liability his responsibility maybe with some few exceptions like for example if i have a if i have a car dealership right and i'm positive that someone came to pay me ten thousand dollars for a car in which the money actually is stolen i'm 100 percent positive i cannot sell that car for him because the money actually is stolen it does have a legitimate owner or the money has been embezzled right uh or taken like you know like by force right i cannot take it but otherwise where did he, you know where, where did he, where, where did he get the money from that's absolutely his you know his liability his responsibility we do fundraising in our message every now and then right are we supposed to ask our donors uh, what, what kind of business you have is your business halal can you donate well well i mean we do not have to now there is another fiqh maxim here that's good to know which is uh اختلافو, well let's keep it simple الحرام لا ينتقل الى ذمتين the 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 prohibition status is not transferable from one individual to another Okay, the prohibition status is not transferable from one to you know from one to another. Okay, I deal with interest. I I I I lend people money with interest. So my money actually is mixed haram and halal. Okay, and I stopped by your grocery store. I want to buy some food, right? Now that money, whenever it is paid, okay, whenever I generate the interest, that's haram for me because I'm lending money with interest. But when I give you the money. You take that money for the for the bread and the cheese and the eggs that you are you know selling. See what I'm saying? 
Yeah. So for you, that money actually is halal. For me, the money is haram. So we have to like draw a line between the, you know, the prohibition status based on the way that you generated the money. Okay. So for me, in our example, that, that money is haram because I'm lending people with interest. I charge interest. But when I pay that interest to you, it's not an interest anymore. It is a price for the bread and the, and the cheese that I'm buying. Okay. Very good example or actually evidence is what happened with the Prophet وسلم, when he stopped by the, the, you know, the house of Barira. Barira actually was a slave girl of, of Aisha radiallahu anha. Right? She was cooking meat, Barira. So the Prophet وسلم, asked her to serve him some meat to eat. She said, Ya Rasulullah, innahu min as sadaqah or this is a donation, providing the Prophet ﷺ does not accept donation, as you know, because if his status, he accepts uh, hadiyah, gift, but not a, not a sadaqah. So he said, huwa laki sadaqah, wa lana hadiyah. Now for you, when you received it, it was a sadaqah, as a slave girl. But when you serve that food, or that meat, to me, it's not a sadaqah anymore, it is a hadiyah, you see? So uh, scholar said, اختلاف الأسباب كاختلاف الأعيان. Okay, the fundamental change behind the reason be, 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 behind the reason of receiving the money is equivalent to the change of the substance itself. So the money actually is haram for me because I took it from riba. The same money, riba, when I pay it to you to buy a car from your car dealership or to buy you know some groceries from your grocery store, it's not haram anymore. Make sense? Yeah. Right. Is um. Okay, no comment, I know. <laughs> the second thing, which is about the uh, the savings, uh, because this is very necessity for, if you go above $10,000, you deposit that, you have to file an STA report, suspicious activity report. So to avoid that, you put a saving account, especially, let's say you have a fundraiser here and you collected, let's say $200,000. You can't deposit that into your checking account but you could uh, deposit that into your saving account without any restriction. So is that a necessity? It depends actually on the reason behind opening a saving account. Okay, reason number one, you can't proceed with any business in the stock market without having money market account, go for it. Number two, you want to, you have like a big chunk of money and you do not want to keep it as uh, at home, right? go ahead and open open another checking account checking account free of charge free of interest and do not release its information do not use it you know uh, uh, checks do not use uh, debit card do not use that account if you just keep it confidential without releasing its information the possibility of identity theft or fraudulent your, your your account okay would go down almost almost to zero so opening a checking account is the solution number three you want to you want to open a saving account okay to be able to make some money or at least to set up the inflation especially nowadays the, the inflation just going crazy nine point something percent which is something like unprecedented in the usa as you know right well if that is the reason then maybe you can open maybe you can open a mutual fund like a halal mutual fund account okay you will generate money way more than what you, you what you will be generating by opening a saving account most importantly in a halal way and we have alhamdulillah a lot of a lot of halal options when it comes to investment in the stock market or, or opening like a mutual fund account go to zaki financial z-a-k-i zaki financial.com i'm the sharia consultant of this company their you know their business actually is good Go to uh, a Azad fund. I'm not on their board, but I know for a fact that, mashallah, you know, their, their, their business model is, uh, you know, is, uh, is good. Okay. We do have Iman fund. We do have Mushar Sharia portfolio. We have, mashallah, 10, 15 different Muslim owned, socially slash ethically responsible mutual fund companies. Invest with them, uh, make halal money. Okay. That's way, way better than you know, jeopardizing. Uh, uh, your money by opening a saving account and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, it depends on the reason behind opening the saving account. Fine. Let's me. You want to run the question and, and, and answer? You, you, you go ahead. Tabla. So you are in charge. Assalamu alaikum, ma'am. 
Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I know a lot of brothers, uh, Muslim brothers, they deal with the uh, stocks and the uh, cryptocurrency. Um, I mean, most of them, they don't know how Islam, um, what's the, you know, how Islam, you know, look at this too. And, you know, what what's your comment here? And if you can talk a little bit about, you know, cryptocurrency and uh, dealing with stocks, stock market. Yani briefly, Karim, we the Mashaikh are the one who's confusing the community because we are not on the same page. Some of us are, are extremely with, some of us are extremely against, and some of us are, you know, undecided, like it's still on the, on the fence. If you ask me as a, you know, as an Amja uh, Fiqh Council, we do not believe, as of today, yani, we do not believe that cryptocurrency is a haram currency. It is not. It is actually imposing itself, getting like more uh, um, acceptance, more popularity, if you wish. Uh, 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 um, a lot of central banks and intercontinental companies do accept cryptocurrency as a, a uh, as a method of payment. Uh, the IRS in the United States is charging tax on cryptocurrency, believe it or not, which is like a very clear indication that that Uncle Sam actually is acknowledging acknowledging cryptocurrency as a as a currency. Uh, uh, the, the other side of the story, Achi, is that it is a decentralized currency. Okay, Mr. Anonymous is still like playing behind the scene. We do not know who's, you know, behind it. Decentralized. There are no uh, measurable facts, you know, behind the significant fluctuation and in, in, in it's more like, you know, uh, purchase, purchase power or market value. Something like very, very close in nature to gambling, right? You do not know what are you investing in. It's a nonsense investment whatsoever. Uh, number three, some people might illegally use it for money laundry, right? But our position is that, again, because it is imposing itself, we cannot just put our heads in the sand and act as if nothing happened. It is there, right? Uh, stay away from it because it is absolutely a nonsense investment whatsoever. All right? uh, very close to gambling in its nature. Uh, you expose yourself to uh, too much unnecessary, unnecessary risk, okay? One of our kids in, in Houston, our, our youth, invested two hundred fifty thousand dollars five years ago, cryptocurrency, bitcoins, and, and, and like other uh, cryptocurrency, and the amount actually jumped to one million dollars within five years. Uh, within just a few weeks, the purchase power, the market value went all the way down to to uh, uh, one hundred fifty thousand. So his loss actually was was $850,000, 850,000. It was almost, almost like talking to himself in the street, like, you know, lost, you know, consciousness because of what happened. I told him, Ya Baba, Ya Muhammad, I told you several times, cryptocurrency is a bad investment. You are not investing in something that makes any sense. Okay? He's a student of knowledge. He's like one of our students at, uh, as guidance college. I told him several times, real estate is the real investment. Can you tell me when you when you purchase a cryptocurrency, what are you buying? What are you selling? How come that you sleep on the night and next day you find yourself making 500% profit? Seriously, is this the real investment? And then, you know, two weeks later, it goes down to 25% to you know, value. What is the reason behind that, that fluctuation going up and down? Is this the, you know, I mean, what kind of value you are adding to the society when you trade in, 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 uh, in cryptocurrency? So the, the, the bottom line, أخي, it's not haram, it's not haram, although like, like if you ask me personally, not as an Amja Mufti, I would say, أخي, wallah, in my opinion, it's closer to haram than to be halal, but I do not dare saying it, okay? it it's not haram, okay? but just to stay away from it. It is, it, is, it, is, it is not, it shouldn't be like within your comfort zone as a religious practicing Muslim investor. Let me just put it this way. No. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing such um, very important uh, knowledge. Uh, we are so lucky to have someone like you. This is very complex. And as you know, there was a lot of interest. So jazakumullah khair for coming. Yeah. And I hope inshallah you would find uh, other people and other means to support your cause inshallah for building and founding the university inshallah ya Rabbi. Allah, may Allah make it easy. Uh, I mean, Going off what you said, real estate, when you tell them that's the way to go, my question is, um, is it 
okay to use um, the same uh, model of Musharaka with guidance uh, to invest in real estate, basically buying, buying second house or third house and renting it out? The answer is, is yes. We as a FETWA committee, the six or seven members, we came up with a, with a verbal agreement that halal investment is as legitimate need as purchasing a home for residential purposes. So purchasing a second house with guidance residential for investment purposes, like, you know, as a rental property would be fine. Go for it. And second one is quick. Uh, you spoke about the model of risk sharing. And I know they call the profit, like profit rate, since you, so you have Musharka, we have the owner in the bank. You live there, so you are paying the rent, which is like the profit. Uh, are the fees, you just mentioned that and it just um, um, came into my mind. Are the fees like um, taxes and insurance are both, let's say in this case, guidance and the owner share, <laughs> pay for no, the both or not? not? No, they do not. Offend. This is like one of the deficiencies or defects or glitches, if you wish, that they do have in their contract. They have their own justification why they are freeing themselves from paying tax, insurance, and, and, and maintenance. But this is actually not the right way of doing business. I mean, they have to commit themselves to their share, the tax and insurance, and, and they do not. But the fact that they are not uh, um, paying their share does not render the whole deal to be haram, no. It is, it is a defect agreement. Uh, agreement, halal agreement with some glitches, but it's still actually overall speaking, taken into consideration the other less Sharia compliant options, I would say, I mean, I mean this model, you know, is, is good enough or halal enough, as, as I always say. Guidance residential is halal enough for those who want to, you know, purchase a uh, home. It is a defect now. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, speaking of, uh, I have two questions. Speaking of uh, insurance, um, I think you started with the fact that, you know, religion itself came uh, to establish justice. So now my question is, uh, let's say in an insurance contract, is it fair for someone to pay premiums or for, let's say, a year, two, three, four, without ever use it, use it? Or to another extent, is it okay for someone to have an insurance contract today and maybe, um, let's say, uh, for example, in a car insurance, right? Uh, get a crash today and have, let's say, you started this month, you pay $50, and then uh, something happened to your car, you ended up with $10,000 uh, damage that the insurance company will pay to you. So, that's okay. Uh, I, I hear you. That, that, okay, that argument actually applies as well to the Social Security, to the Medicare, and to the Medicaid. Yani is, it, is it fair enough for you? to have an account of the social security and just pay for a few months and Allah forbid you just passed away. Okay. And they started like paying to your wife and your kids, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars, although during your lifetime, you pay just maybe just a few dollars, like a few hundred dollars, and then you passed away. And they continued like paying and paying and paying your wife until, you know, until the end of your life, your kids until the age of 24. Okay. So you paid a few hundreds and then you passed away and they paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? Is that, is that fair enough? I mean, using, using the same, you know, the same, the same argument. Yes, like, like I said, if justice, justice, you shouldn't get more than, unless, unless maybe, uh, instead of partaking in it as a customer, unless maybe you partake in, uh, in it as a shareholder, then I would understand. Well, if you if you if you like look at the genesis, like the, the, the actual contract, it has nothing to do with all these details. The actual contract is a commitment between two different contracting parties. If you pay me the social security one hundred fifty dollars a month, okay, 
if something happened to you, rest in peace, do not worry, I will pay your wife and kids such and such amount. Most probably, I will pay them way, way more than what you have paid me during your lifetime. Life insurance company is telling you the same. If you pay me $150 now and you pass away, instead of paying your kids and your wife monthly, I'm going to issue like a one-time check of $1 million. What you are purchasing from them is the peace of mind, is the social security, is the guarantee okay, that if I'm to pass today, tomorrow morning actually my kids will be getting a check. You are not buying money. You are not buying insurance. You are just bu buying a, a peace of mind. They call it insurance. Okay. When it comes to life insurance, the name actually is wrong. Life insurance actually is a wrong name. You are not, you are not having insurance against death. Everybody will be passing away, right? But you are actually taking some possible measures to secure financial stability for those affected people because of losing their bread maker. See what I'm saying? So what you are buying actually is the is the peace of mind, is the social security. Okay, uh, uh, you know from day one what are you buying. You know from day one that they are committed to paying you. Well, if you stay alive until the age of 80, for example, like my life insurance, alhamdulillah, I, I lived from now until 80 without having any problem. So whatever I paid is, is, is already gone because of the aman or the security or the assurance that they are giving me. And if I'm to pass before the age of 80, well, they are committed to paying my wife and kids one time check of, of $1 million. It's a, it's, it's a win-win situation. How do they de determine the premium based on the data that they have. I mean, they know that, okay, in the last, the Wajal, certain number of people will be passing away. The compensation or the insurance balance will, will, will be such and such. They need such and such amount, you know, to make some, you know, some, some living for themselves. Based on that, they decide, well, your premium should be $150 a, a month. Uh, you take it or you, or you leave. Does this bring justice, in my opinion? It brings a lot of, a lot of justice and peace of mind and comfort actually for, you know, for everybody, especially in this society. If you are Akhil Karim back home, you still have some kind of like, you know, social uh, family ties, neighbors stand with you and with your family members, your dad, your brothers, your sisters. It's, it's, okay, it's not the case here. You are literally, literally by your own. Maybe the community might sympathize with you one time and just, you know, do a, a you know, a donation or fundraising for your family members. But are we really willing to put our, you know, family members in this position? Should I wait until I see my, you know, wife and, and kids standing by the door of the masjid? Yes, I don't know. I mean, why? On the other hand, on the other hand, what is the difference between life insurance and social security? It's the same. It's bilateral agreement, commitment, makes everybody happy. Wallahu alam. Uh, my last question is with regard to uh, investments. We have different uh, investment instruments. Uh, let's say bonds, for example, uh, preferred stock, common stocks. Let's say common stock is an ownership of uh, a share of a company. Uh, for example, Google is technology company, but um but Budweiser is um, an alcohol company uh is it okay now to invest in those publicly traded company that no no th you need to do your own due diligence and, and find out what company you want to trade in uh, it's not that simple yes. you need you need to make sure you need to make sure that the core of business is a halal one the debt asset ratio is to the minimum. The interest bearing investment is to the minimum. The generated interest actually is to the minimum. In order for you to get all this information, you need to run your portfolio or the potential stock that you wanna trade in by a professional specialized licensed individual who can give you the information. Go to atina, A-A-T-I-N-A-A.co, atina.co, and just enter the name of the, of the stock that you are interested in. Okay, it's it's a free service. Okay. They have like a search bar at you know, a a t i n a a dot c o. I'm the Sharia consultant of this company. They are extremely conservative when it comes to investing in the stock market. Okay, they show me every every three months a list of twelve thousand different financial instruments. 
12,000. And because of the algorithm, the, because of the, like the, the formula that they use, they drop them, they filterize them from 12,000 all the way to maybe 800 or just 1,000 Sharia compliant stock. And the rest of them are to be excluded. Okay. 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 So go to their website, enter the name of the stock that you're interested in, and see the report. If they say that it passes, it passes. Sometimes they exclude it, although actually the, that asset ratio is uh, is okay. Into sparing, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, investment is okay. Generated interest is okay. Uh, uh, core business is okay. If, if all these checks actually are okay, then go with the stock, even if they disapprove it. Because again, I mean, like they are extremely conservative when it comes to uh, choosing choosing stocks. Um, I get the the ratios, but Fine. however, let's say even a halal company that does borrow on interest to do business. Are we looking at minimums or are we looking no, at? That, that yeah, it, it has to be to the minimum. It has to be to the minimum, as simple as that. Sheikh. Sheikh, uh, yeah, The finance department of any car dealership by default is an independent entity financially, legally, and administratively. So Honda Finance is different from Honda car dealership. Uh, it's not it's not one company, right? So if, if Honda Finance, for example, is offering you 3% APR, it means that you are borrowing money with interest. Unless you can prove otherwise, uh, unless you can prove that no, Honda Finance is owned 100% by the Honda car dealership. If that is proven, then any kind of APR would be would be fine because you are not you are not borrowing money. This is just a markup for the for the installment or higher price for the installment. By default, yes, completely completely independent, with some exceptions. Salam alaikum, Jazakallah khair for your talk, Sheikh. Sure. Um, two quick ones. Um, first is all right over here. <laughs> Um, so I, I use this app called Zoya, which you may have heard of, which looks into like Amana and Azad, Azad and all those other organizations. And they say they're not 100% in terms of halal. What is your opinion on that? And does that mean I have to donate whatever is not halal from those organizations to... Well, I have Zoya, different, Zoya. different websites and different apps claim to be like, you know, um, standards for, for, for halal investment. What kind of standards they have, I do not know. Who is standing behind them, I do not know. Any Anyone like checking their business like a Sharia audit, I have no clue whatsoever. In this country, everybody does whatever he or she wants. Everybody claims to be Sharia compliant. If you do not know the people behind the business, I would I would say, I mean, stay away from it. So not every single ad claims are like to be uh, purely Sharia compliant. It means that they are Sharia compliant. Anyone can just, you know, Claim to be a Sharia compliant. The, the, the safest way actually is to go with a company or with an app where you know the people behind it, who is in charge, who is doing what. If you trust the people behind the project, go for it. As I said, like when I tell you that, as said, although I'm not on their Sharia board, but I know that they do have Sharia advisor and supervisory board, their business, alhamdulillah, is good enough. Right. When I tell you that Sharia there, and it works for you because I'm the icons. I know what they do, so I can like bear witness. I can pass a fatwa or a judgment of professional opinion on the companies that I do have an access to their data. I know what they do, but if someone I do not have an access to them, well, I do not know. And second one but, is oh sorry, just a quick, quick second one. This is about um, private mortgage insurance. So if you don't have twenty percent for your house with down payment. You mentioned just in general, thinking that insurance is not a problem, but what is your opinion specifically on private mortgage insurance? If life insurance is halal, then everything else is. <laughs> so okay. just take it easy. Right. Dr. Al-Quda, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, 
uh, you you told the maqasid behind uh, not having not prohibiting riba is exploit not to oppress the poor and then you gave me the example of john smith so i'm taking out from john john smith or maybe muhammad abdullah from guide 150 and then bank of america gives me the same thing for 110 would not bank of america be more in line with the maqasid of you know not exploiting the poor why would i then have to choose guys instead of bank of america there no i disagree because the the, the exploitation is not based on the profit rate or, or the interest rate it is based on the amount of liability that bank of america actually is taking bank of america has not taken any liability whatsoever after 10 years i mean you want to uh, you want to terminate the agreement right you put the you put the house in the market okay you sell it right and you have to pay them back the principal that they have paid for you right uh, this is actually against against the maqasid if there is any appreciation or depreciation uh, uh, you are by your own okay uh, the, the appreciation is yours the, the, the depreciation is incurred by you they do not care right no maintenance no tax no insurance nothing whatsoever right so uh, exploitation is not based on how much they charge you extra i mean this is one of the factors but the most important factor actually is the is the amount of liability that they carry on throughout the whole you know partnership long with you whenever there is a partnership but if there is no partnership whatsoever then, then they are actually exploited because this is a riskless transaction or risk shifting deal we just give you the money you are by your own we do not care about it oh, all right no. one last question and then we can wrap last up. question yeah, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my question is kind of simple. Um, you mentioned the opportunity cost, which I, I really enjoyed hearing because usually you never hear that. Um, a lot of brothers, you know, I help try to help out in different ways, but we're also talking about inflation, right? So how do you deal with someone trying to provide a loan when the inflation is 10% and a brother says, well, I'll give you the loan back in 10 years and that money that you've loaned them literally is worth nothing at that time and so i kind of want to know how inflation is dealt with whether it's two percent well you are or not ten percent yeah you are not supposed to give him a loan to start with yeah because, because this is an investment loan yeah and we said several times that loan is not a mode of finance in the Islamic finance system mm -hmm. yeah okay? i do have one hundred thousand dollars cash mm -hmm. and you approached me that that you want my money 14 years interest-free loan and i know for a fact that you want to take my money to do business mm -hmm. right is it is it is it a good uh, like a good decision for me to lend you one hundred thousand dollars into free for 10 years while I'm, you will be in business is that fair enough yeah, and is it fair enough for you to take my money into free no, no. for 10 years and then you come back after 10 years giving me one hundred thousand dollars with the with the with the depreciation or inflation maybe well Purchase power actually reduced maybe 20%. And then you give me a big hug, Jazakallah Khair. Thank you so much for your money. So okay. in previous talks, they've said, yes, it is fair. But uh, I'm glad to hear that you're saying it's not fair. Yeah, well, I mean, there is no inflation issue if you go with the Islamic finance system because you are establishing a partnership. Yeah. Right? Partnership actually means that you are entitled or I'm entitled for a certain percentage of the profit regardless of the purchase power okay or the market value if you wish of the or the, even even the inflation of the money because i did not give you the money as a loan i gave you the money as an investment as a business as a partnership but that concern actually does not even does not even you know takes place when the loan is not given as a mode of finance to start with no. awesome i think that's a wrap uh you have one more. I think the oh, brother, brother here does have a okay. question. Are you fine with a couple more yeah, questions? Assalamu alaikum. Salam. Uh, when you buy a house with the guidance, you said this is partnership, not like a loan or something. How will you do with the student loan? Like how you get partnership with a student when I go to college? Oh, I mean, it's no tangible things. You mentioned something about student loan. 
Well, there is no, there is no partnership here. There is no partnership when it comes to student loan. Student loan actually is a, is a loan, like, like from its name, you can tell. Someone actually is borrowing money to pay the tuition fees, right? Now, if your question is about the status of a student loan, can a Muslim student borrow money with interest for education purposes? Our official position as MJ is that if that student does not have any halal by default options like grants, financial aid, scholarships, then he or she has to go with the subsidized loan, right? Which is an interest-free loan for a certain period of time. If the subsidized loan is not available and that person actually is on the spot, right? He cannot proceed with any like in you know, higher education, uh, like college degree, undergrad or a graduate or PhD or whatever then borrowing money with interest for education purposes would be permitted as an exception. That's the official position of MJ, right? Now, you might say, what's the difference between borrowing money for education versus borrowing money for home mortgaging, right? The difference actually is huge. If you are unable, unable to find a halal mortgage for your house, you can fulfill your need by renting a house. So you can rent a house, okay? Now your need actually is to find a place to live in. You don't have to be the owner. You don't have to be the landlord. So the alternative actually is there. You cannot own a house in a halal way, rent a house. But if you cannot afford paying tuition fees for your college, what will happen? Is there any alternative? You'll be just out of the college, out of, out of the program, right? So a student loan is a kind of necessity. You either borrow money with interest or you are just kicked out of the of the program and no PhD, no master's for you. Uh, home mortgage is a kind of haja or need. Okay. Um, everybody actually here needs to, you know, to own a house. But that need does not justify borrowing money with interest because that need could be fulfilled by just renting the house. That's the difference between, you know, a home mortgage versus a student loan. No. Sorry. Uh, so same answer for him. Taib subhanak Allah, muhammadik ashadu Allah, ilaha illa ant. Nastafiru wa natubu alayk. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.